today we're going to continue our discussion about eukaryotes and we're going to review the helminths. And you might think, well, gosh, what on earth are the helminths? Well, the helminths are worms. And again, we're going to focus on the worms that cause human disease. There are certainly many different types of worms on the planet, but we're only going to think about the ones that infect the human host. So helminths, again, are multicellular worms, and they're parasites. And what, as we remember from the parasite lecture, what that means is that part of the life cycle is spent in the human host. And in this case, um, these helminths spend part, if not all, of their life in the human host. So there are three kinds of helminths that are medically significant. One type are the flatworms, and they can be the trematodes, these flukes, or the tapeworms, and we're going to have a more detailed discussion about the tapeworms. Uh, the thorny worms are intermediate, and then the uh, round worms are exactly how they sound. They're round, of course, and these are worms that reside in the gastrointestinal tract. They can also reside in the blood, in the lymphatics, and the subcutaneous tissue. So the second example we're going to discuss is actually a roundworm example. Isn't that fun? Uh, let's go on. Okay, so what are the biological properties? The uh, life cycles of these organisms are very complicated. Again, they involve the human host. And the intermediate stages can be spent either in the uh, earth, of course, they can be spent in other organisms. And the two examples we're going to review are examples where the intermediate stages reside in other organisms. So in, in terms of these intermediate stages, there it's very much like the fungi. Remember we talked about the fungi, we talked about some bacteria have stages like this and also the protozoa. So the way that it's important for you to develop a working knowledge of microbiology is to find the organisms that share things in common. And we've discussed several things, uh, several properties that many microorganisms share in common. And one of these principles is really life outside the human host. Does it, does that life occur in the soil? Does it occur in spore stages? Does it occur in hyphae stages? Does it occur again in other organisms? And then how is, how are these intermediate stages transmitted to the human host? How are the potentially adult stages? How do they leave the human host? So all of these principles can really be ways in which you can link together several different types of microorganisms. So the adult helminths, uh, the worms, they can be uh, dioecious. Now this term, we haven't seen this term before, and this term is used exclusively in plants and invertebrates. So in mammals, we don't discuss the term dioecious. Um, and you know, the, but then the um, these helminths also have a monoecious uh, stage where both the male and female organs are actually in the same organism. So in terms of reproduction in the human host, it can really only occur when both the male and female are present in the same location in the same human host. That's very important. So what are some of the characteristics of helminths? Well, first of all, uh, a large number of them don't have a digestive system. Now, again, if, for instance, the worm is living out in the earth on its own, probably they have a digestive tract. But these obligate parasites that are helminths often don't have a digestive tract. And quite frankly, they don't need one because we're going to talk about why that is. So these helminths, because they're living in these wonderfully nutritious places like the bloodstream or the lymphatics or the intestines, right, they can just absorb the nutrients from the human host. And especially if, depending on where they live in the digestive tract, boy, if they're right there in that 
uh, small intestine, they get pre-digested uh, protein, carbohydrates, and lipids. So also because these helminths basically don't do much, they don't need an extensive nervous system. And because, quite frankly, they don't really have to look for food. They just have to sit around and consume the food. So, and also the environment within the human host is very constant, of course, and that they may completely, in fact, lack the ability to move around and they are entirely dependent on the host for survival. So we're basically gonna see two examples of how this wonderful lifestyle occurs in these organisms. So here is the worldwide incidence of Hellman's infections. And you can see that, uh, boy, there's quite a large number of people who are infected. And again, these are known infections. Now, a lot of individuals have these parasites and they don't know it. So in order for us to record indeed what the incidence is, we have to be able to confirm whether or not these individuals are cases. So these are known infections and there's probably at least as many, if not many more that are not known. So you can see here the intestinal helminths are located in uh, the tropical world pretty much. And so you might say to yourself, well, gosh, what is it? Is it the uh, weather? Is it um, the soil conditions? Is it the environment? Is it the moisture? Well, you know, it's all of these things, but also the role of nutrition is really important here because in some individuals, when, you know, the, these locations on the earth also have quite a high uh, occurrence of malnutrition and these malnourished indi individuals are much more susceptible to development of these microorganisms, uh, micro uh, infections, so to speak. And we've talked about, we've talked about bacterial infections, viral infections, uh, protozoan infections, fungal infections, and now helminth infections. And the same part of the globe has high incidences of all of these diseases. So the red area here are countries where intestinal helminths are a public health problem. Now the pink countries are also where these organisms can get transmitted as well. Now, what do we know about the pink uh, countries? Well, they're cooler, of course, and uh, they also have higher socioeconomic status. So, you know, all of these things uh, certainly come into play when we think about why some countries have high incidence of disease. But the other factor is sanitation, right? That sanitation in some of these countries is not very good. So soil transmitted helminths are also essentially located in almost the same countries. And these are helminths, we're not gonna discuss the soil based in too much detail, but these are helminths where part of the life cycle occurs in the soil. So the first example we're gonna talk about is the helminth that causes filariasis. And filariasis is, can be a very serious disease. And there's this whole dynamic that occurs between the human host and the immune system. And actually we're gonna spend a whole separate lecture on that topic, but meanwhile, we'll brush upon it in today's lecture as well. So this filariasis worm, Wucheria bancrofti, is a round worm and it inhabits or it lives in the lymphatic tissue. And so again, you have to link this principle with some of these other diseases. So if a pathogen, if a microbe lives in the bloodstream, pretty much the way it got there is generally by an arthropod vector. And in this case, uh, in Wucheria, we have the mosquito transmitting Wucheria, as well as all these other diseases, right, that also occur in the tropical environment. And in this case, the mosquito uh, transmit these larvae, and these larvae then go into the lymphatics and uh, colonize, right? You have to attach and colonize. 
and then they grow into adults. So the female worms, of course, produce larvae, and uh, these microfilarae uh, circulate into the blood, and then the whole cycle gets repeated. So here's a wonderful diagram of that whole process. So you can see, step number one, mosquito takes a bite, right? And in that number one, what's being transmitted is these microfilarae, and then these, um, actually these uh, organisms then migrate through the blood supply to the lymphatics where they grow up to be adults. And then these adults produce these microfilarae and a mosquito takes a bite from this infected individual. And then the rest of the life cycle really is spent in the, in the mosquito, these intermediate stages and these larvae migrate to the head and the proboscis, which is the appendage that actually pierces the skin, and these larvae enter the skin at that stage. So previously I had said the microfilarae, but that's not true. It's actually the larvae stage that enters the human host, and that larvae stage travels again to these lymphatics where these adults uh, eventually grow up and then multiply. So again, remember, we have to have a male and a female living in the same vicinity, the same lymphatic system, and that's how reproduction occurs. So what are the symptoms? Well, you know, gosh, when you do a search on parasitic diseases, boy, you see some pretty um, extreme physiological examples. Well, this filariasis is certainly one of them. And there's a particular condition called elephantiasis where these individuals who are infected develop these very, very lar enlarged, uh, usually legs, right, where these organisms have infiltrated the lymphatic system of that particular location. So that, uh, I guess phenotype, that condition is called lymphedema. So then you might say, well, what is lymphedema? Well, and I'm going to backtrack and talk a little bit about lymphedema because I think then once you understand what lymph lymphedemia is, then you will see the significance of this particular infection. So other uh, individuals who develop lymphedema are women who have had breast cancer. And you might think, well, what is the relationship between breast cancer and lymphedema? Well, just let me explain. So the relationship here is what happens with women who have breast cancer. They, depending on the severity of the cancer, they get, often they get mastectomies, for instance. And in that process, uh, surgeons often remove the lymph nodes that are in the uh, arm area or in the shoulder, right? And, or even under the arm as well. And when that happens, then the lymphatic system uh, in that area has nowhere to drain. So then often the skin and the area around that place becomes very swollen. So sometimes women who are recovering for breast cancer end up developing a very enlarged arm. And that's a very characteristic sign. And that enlargement is called lymphedema. Well, this particular organism also produces the same kind of condition. And the reason for that is these organisms migrate uh, and live actually in the lymph nodes. And for instance, if there's quite a number of them, they can actually block the lymphatic drainage and then you can get this enlarged appendage like this. And it isn't always the leg, sometimes it's the arm, sometimes in men it's their penile area. And in any event, it's a very disfiguring condition. And, um, and, and these symptoms don't usually appear until many years after the infection. So in those early years, for instance, individuals can be infected and not even know it. Uh, and fortunately for those individuals who are infected, there are only a small number who end up developing uh, this lymphedema. So, so this prolonged swelling can actually produce a condition called thickening of the skin or elephantiasis. 
So the interesting thing here that we're going to spend a whole separate lecture about is these different relationships that occur with these microorganisms and the immune system. And interestingly, with these helminths, uh, some individuals have a very hypersensitive reaction with their immune systems, and some individuals don't. And often it's the reaction of the immune system that causes the problem, not necessarily the uh, living of the parasite in the human host, unless, of course, there are so many parasites or the parasites are so large that they can actually block physiological function. But in many individuals in the tropic environments, you have situations where they certainly are infected with these helminths, for instance, and the immune system has learned a type of tolerance with them where you don't have a extreme reaction. So there's some sort of commensalism going on and basically, in that situation, you can almost even have an immune suppression. And there is coexistence of the human host and these helminths. And, you know, in some ways, that can be adaptive. Now, the other situation, though, is with especially children. Now, if children are infected with parasites, especially these helminths, what can happen is these helminths can actually rob the kids of nutrients and you can get stunting, you can get retardation, you can get all kinds of conditions, you can get enhanced malnutrition simply because the parasite, the pathogen, is basically eating all the food. Okay, so, you know, that's not certainly a good thing to happen. But in some individuals, you get a low parasite burden but you get a heightened uh, immune response. And in this individual here, that individual doesn't potentially have as many organisms as the other one, but that immune system launched a very heightened attack. And in this case, uh, with filariasis, you get a, you know, you know, you get this elephantiasis condition, whereas if there was some sort of uh, commensalism going on, potentially, maybe you wouldn't even have that type of immune reaction. So, again, this is a new theory, and we're going to spend an entire lecture on just this topic, because there's some other investigators that think that this helminth infection has driven a lot of co-evolution with the immune with the human immune system. So in any event, it's going to be one of the, in my opinion, more interesting discussions that we've had, but we've had many, uh, in my opinion, that are very contemporary and certainly interesting. So what about this filariasis distribution? Now I'm focusing on India because I'm actually doing research in India. Uh, colleagues of mine and I are doing a study of HIV in southern India, and we're noticing a lot of other co-infections occurring in this environment. So uh, filariasis is certainly one of them, and you can see the reddened area in the bottom uh, figure, in the bottom map, is where basically filariasis is endemic. Now, I've been uh, to southern India now several times, and so far I haven't seen anyone with filariasis. But, you know, I have seen some um, tropical diseases that basically you never, never see in the United States. So anyway, depending on where I am in these lectures, you may hear some more stories about my uh, experience in India. But anyway, so this filariasis tends to occur, as we saw in the map, right, in these tr tropical environments and where now the other the other reason right that's where the mosquitoes are very endemic as well so the second uh, example we're going to talk about are tapeworms and there's two different kinds of tapeworms there's the uh, beef uh, tapeworm the solium the tinea solium and the pork tape tapeworm saginata and the two of them are intestinal uh, worms, uh, cestodes, and um, they are obligate uh, parasites. And uh, so what I'm going to do in this lecture is talk about the different uh, 
anatomical structures of the uh, tapeworm and then talk about uh, some of the issues that uh, occur with this organism. So tinea is a tapeworm that lives in the digestive tract and it absorbs uh, nutrients through its cu cuticle. And, you know, just for the heck of it, I found this picture of this tinea solium uh, uh, sitting in a, a beach chair, just, you know, having the time of its life, right? Because basically these organisms don't have to do much. They just sit around in the digestive tract and absorb food. Um, so these, these organisms have these segments, these proglottids, and they just, they're like a ladder or, or like a, um, a, a, a snake or, or, or even a vertebrae, right? You, they, section by section get added to this organism and they just keep elongating. And the scolex is the part of the organism, we'll see the next slide, that actually hooks into the intestinal mucosa. And each of these scolexes, um, have both male and female uh, reproductive organs and basically they can produce eggs. So when, for instance, the um, proglottids are shed, then they can, they already have a pre-equipped, uh, I guess, sack of eggs, right, that can turn around and become more uh, tapeworms. So these mature segments actually contain uh, eggs, and these eggs can go on to uh, certainly other life stages. So here's a picture of a tinea, and you can see these proglottids, and in each proglottid we have both an ovary and a testes, and then we have a collection of eggs. So when they drop off, for instance, they can, they're, they're actually a self-contained organism. And then you can see the scolex. So we have both hooks and suckers in the scolex. And then we have the neck region. So the neck region is really where the new segments get added on. And then as they get added on, the organism gets longer and longer. So here's a picture of the life cycle. So you might want to say, well, gosh, how on earth can we get a tapeworm? Well, um, you can actually get a tapeworm from eating uh, undercooked meat, both beef or pork. So here, we'll start off at the beginning. So these proglotted segments, right, um, actually are, in, can, uh, are shed in the feces of a human organism. They can be passed into the environment. Now, we know, for instance, in these tropical environments that uh, sanitation isn't very good, and a number of individuals, quite a, a large proportion of the population, basically defecates in the environment. Um, and so if it's a rural area, for instance, the cattle and pigs can become infected by ingesting vegetation that have these proglottids. And then these proglottids, so we have, remember, each of them have eggs. These eggs hatch and these uh, micro oncospheres, right, migrate to the muscle tissue of the uh, pork and beef. And so then these uh, oncospheres develop into these cysts that reside in the um, musculature of these organisms. And guess what? Well, that's the part of the organism that the humans uh, consume. And so for instance, if they're uh, raw or undercooked, then potentially you can ingest these cysts. And these cysts can grow up to become tapeworms. And again, you know, these tapeworms can live for years in the human host. They're inside the digestive tract. So what do we know about the digestive tract? Well, the digestive tract is almost like, and in fact is, essentially considered outside of the body. We've got these epithelial cells, and these uh, tapeworms can simply especially sit around uh, in the small or even the large intestine and basically soak up the nutrients. So we're going to have a picture here. And, you know, the, the way I was put in touch with this phenomenon was actually through a student of mine who wrote a paper on tapeworms. And in the paper, she discussed 
there's a whole underground uh, number of individuals and maybe even ha health practitioners who actually recommend the use of tapeworms to actually enable people to lose weight. Now, when I first heard about it, I really had to question her. And then I looked up some of her references and indeed, it's something that, again, is very underground in today's world, but it does happen. And especially in, um, for instance, the underground anorexia community also knows all about tapeworms. So in answer to the question, is this an urban myth or reality? Actually, it's a reality. Uh, frighteningly enough, it is a reality. Okay, so our first question of the day is, what are some of the ways one could reduce the incidence of filariasis? Okay, so remember, what is filariasis? It's that uh, helminth that lives in the lymphatic tissue. Okay, so how are filariasis, how is filariasis, how are those Wicheria bancrofti worms transmitted? They're transmitted by mosquitoes. So possibly we could, right, uh, eradicate the mosquitoes. If we eradicate the vector, we eradicate the disease. What are some other ways? Well, gosh, you know, what kind of, you know, anti-wormicide uh, would you use? What kind of worm, it's actually called a wormicide. What kind of wormicide would you use, especially if the worms are living in the lymphatic system? The, the actual medications, can be toxic, right? So potentially the, the way to approach this problem is to think about the immune reaction. So can we suppress the immune reaction? And if we, for instance, suppress the immune reaction, then potentially the organism can turn into a kind of commensal relationship where the organisms can coexist. Now, I, I'm not sure many practitioners would actually suggest this, but as we have seen, it could be that the immune reaction is really what's causing the symptoms. So for instance, if the individual is certainly disfigured extremely by this element elephantiasis, then potentially we can work on draining the lymphatics and, you know, maybe we could even perform surgery and remove the lymph node where, or lymph nodes where the organism lives. Or we could, if it's not that extreme, we could potentially uh, administer some mild immunosuppressive drugs and potentially move the relationship into one that's more commensal, and then potentially there could be coexistence. Or, now if we wanted to make a difference in relationship to the whole community, then we would think about eradication of mosquitoes. So the second example really is trying to get at the question of, do you think tapeworms could be used for weight loss treatment. And honestly, as extreme as it sounds, again, there are individuals who actually have tried this. Now, the one, um, there are several cautionary uh, reasons why one wouldn't want to do this because there is an extreme uh, stage of this particular organism where the tapeworm certainly can migrate to other tissues, including, for instance, the nervous system. And, you know, we don't really um, think that uh, having an organism like that in one's digestive tract is a really good idea. But the other issue going on here is that this individual is a source of infection for other people, right? So these are the cons, right? So the, another con is certainly the impact 
on rest of organism. And the risk to other tissues. Now the pros. Are there any pros? There always needs to be, you know, some kind of pro because often, you know, if you ever get a question like this, it would mean that uh, the professor is not interested so much in um, uh, the, the sort of notoriety of the question, but really, do you understand the mechanisms well enough to create some kind of comparison like this? So the pros would be potentially a weight loss treatment. Okay, so you might say, well, gosh, you know, we have other treatments available. Yes, but not, first of all, not many treatments. And second of all, the treatments that are available, at least surgery, surgical treatments, are pretty invasive. So what do we have? We have gastric bypass, gastric banding. Those are pretty extreme sorts of surger, surgical approaches to the problem of obesity. So if, for instance, we could bioengineer a benign tapeworm or a tapeworm-like uh, treatment, right? Maybe we can um, bioengineer a tapeworm that would be completely benign, right? That could live uh, commensally in the intestinal tract. And basically that, uh, that organism could soak up the excess food that the individual is consuming. So you might want to say, well, gosh, why doesn't the patient or the individual just stop eating so much? Well, you know, it's very, very challenging to lose weight. And some individuals are very prone to weight gain. And so possibly this could be a solution. And unfortunately, because this uh, is an underground problem, right? So it's underground. It's not regulated. And there are no uh, reputable medical professionals who would touch this problem. And so really the whole point here is that there is always a pro and con. But in my opinion, the cons much more outweigh the pros. So in conclusion, uh, I, as a scientist, would not recommend that uh, individuals consider tapeworms as a method for uh, weight loss. So in that event, let's conclude the lecture. Thank you so much for visiting educator.com.